Hi, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for joining us to our Focus on Latin panel. Today, we will be trying to bring some information about what's going on in the sports betting industry in Latin America. Is the emergence of Latin American markets stopped by the current shortage of sports events? Is the market adapting to the new demands of the global gambling audience? These are the questions our professionals will try to answer us in less than 40 minutes. Uh, let me introduce to the speakers. These guys are great professionals in the gaming industry. Karen Sierra, she leads GLI Latams and Caribbean Division for both regulatory and business development. Antonio Salor Domingos, Sales Director at Magland Robotech. Antonio is a Latin American gaming business professional with in-depth knowledge of online and retail operations. Neil Montgomery is the founding and managing partner at Montgomery and Associados, the leading full-service Brazilian law firm dedicated to gaming and betting. Angelo Alberoni, the business relations manager at Viva Gold, the sports betting platform. So thank you so much to all of you and thank you for waking up so early, Karen and Antonio. They are in Las Vegas and Peru. Okay, let's start with Brazil and let's talk about esports. Are them an opportunity or a challenge? Let's start. I, I would like to start with Karen, but I believe that we have some issues in her audio. So um, let's start with you, Neil. Well, I think from the Brazilian perspective, what I can bring to this discussion as a lawyer is maybe to uh, address what the legal uh, framework is here in Brazil at the moment. In terms of sports betting, uh, there was a law uh, legalized and finally sports betting after many, many decades of uh, discussion and conversation at the end of 2018. It was law 13,756. And this finally uh, opened up the possibility of uh, sports betting uh, being operated legally in Brazil because generally speaking, uh, games of chance and betting in general are prohibited under the current uh, regulations here in Brazil. Uh, under this law, uh, it provided a time frame of two plus two years for the Ministry of Economy, which is the current regulator, to lay down the regulations, uh, laying out the, the rules on how a license would be obtained. Uh, we're now one and a half years past uh, the initial uh, start line and still the Ministry of Economy uh, has not issued uh, the regulations. There have been three rounds of public consultation where the industry stakeholders have been able to contribute their opinions. Uh, the last one was just before the pandemic. The deadline closed on the 6th of March. Uh, the Ministry received thousands of contributions. Probably it was the, the round of better quality uh, because what was given to public consultation was a draft presidential decree because here in Brazil federal laws as the law that was enacted in 2018 must be regulated by a decree which is issued by the president in this case President Bolsonaro and so a draft decree uh, had been uh, submitted to the public in previous rounds. The last, the latest draft was this one in the third round of consultation. And it brought an important change to the business model that the government is looking to implement. Before, uh, the business model that was being um, signaled was one of authorization, where there would be an unlimited number of licenses to sports betting operators uh, that would establish themselves in Brazil, open up a Brazilian company and obtain a license. With the latest draft presidential decree, the government switched totally to a different model called the concession, which is much more complex. It's like a bidding process and there would be only a limited number of licenses. The government initially mentioned that there could be uh, up to 30 licenses. More recently, the regulator said that this number could be changed. But uh, in the latest round of public consultation, there are still a lot of uncertainties because uh, the, the draft decree uh, was really shortened 
and important information like the inv invitation to bid or the draft concession agreement was not made available. So still the market does not have vital information as, for example, what is the price to be paid for the license? And there has been a, a lot of discussion in the last few years as well, especially since the law was enacted in 2018 about the tax element because uh, the, the tax uh, that was um, mentioned in the 2018 law is 3%, uh, a turnover tax of 3% for online uh, uh, operators it would be 6% uh, for land base, but on the online side it would be 3%. They tried to uh, reduce that in the first drafts of the decree to 1%, but as a decree cannot overturn a law that was enacted by Congress, what the current turnover rate is, is still the 3% for online. So at the moment, there's still uh, discussions. Uh, the regulator mentioned that now in July, the BNEDS, which is the Brazilian uh, Economic and Development Bank, is going to be appointed to spearhead this process of um, fine-tuning uh, the decree, engaging legal advisors, financial advisors, and that process should take uh, most of the second half of 2020. So the plan is to potentially have the regulations out by the end of this year or the beginning of uh, next year, potentially just before uh, ICE 2021. So this is the current scenario in Brazil. The market, the industry is waiting to see what the regulations are going to be potentially before moving forward here in Brazil. Okay, that's good. That's good. Thank you, Neil. And what about Angela? What do you think about this situation in Brazil? We, we try to, to start talking about esports. And yeah. Neil, <laughs> lead me to, the, to my second questions about the regulation of sports betting in Brazil. So what about you? What do you think about this? Okay, uh, I will talk about the esports because uh, I think Neil is an uh, expert of yep. law and, uh, and resume yeah, yeah, yeah. everything is going on in Brazil perfectly. So, in my opinion, I think the regulation is coming uh, in the middle of the next year. It's my personal opinion, 2021. Uh, it's a mess now because we had three three different public consultations, and the last one was totally crazy out of the, 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 the environment. So it's very difficult to, to preview what is coming in Brazil uh, about the regulation, but the regulation is coming. This, this is, 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 is certainly. So I will talk about the, the esports. It's my my field in mm -hmm. sport betting also. So specifically about the esports in Brazil, it's necessary to contextualize first because currently Brazil is the third country uh, in the world of broadcast viewers behind China and USA. It's a huge market in Brazil. We have important names in the main games like uh, League of Legends and CSGO. And this one is the perfect of, uh, by Neymar. Neymar is a uh, sponsor of a uh, CSGO uh, uh, eSport team, Furia, in Brazil. Uh, Brazil has, uh, has been uh, uh, so popular in Brazil in many years. So it's a huge, huge market in our country. I was privileged to, to see Close the Flamengo League of Legends uh, team uh, building, so it was very interesting to 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 be uh, in the in that moment. And uh, also the Esports Brazil Awards, it's the largest award in, in Latin America. So Esports in Brazil, it's a it's a huge market. However, uh, I believe in terms of uh, sport betting. The great challenge of esports is not only to bring this new audience to betting, but mainly to educate those who are already betters to, to know better the esports environment. Uh, in these times of crisis, it's a great time to invest in the esports education strategy to, to, to the operator side. Uh, a survey by H2 Gambling Capital last, last week, I think. Uh, show that esports will double his size by 2024 from 1.6 to 3.2 percent of the turnover of uh, all bats in, in the world. So it's a it's a huge movement. Uh, and if you think on the growth to double this this size is something spectacular. But when you look in uh, at in a broader terms. 3.2% is very little uh, 
for the size of the esports market. They, they, they could be bigger than 2% of all, all betting uh, activities in our, in our industry. Uh, this is the, 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 the audience that we must to improve. Uh, the esports audience is still very stigmatized as being children uh, or under 18. And this is not 100% true. Uh, New Zoos, an uh, important uh, consulting company, uh, last survey related that the majority of this audience is between 18 and 34 years old. Um, another thing that uh, we need to understand is that audience. They, they, they don't like to play uh, or to bat in traditional sports. And cross-selling here, it's very, very hard. It's very difficult to, to make. So for this niche, is the other way around. You, you operators must to, to, to educate themselves and how to do a bat, how, how the batting environment could fit uh, into the esports industry. It's a, it's a two way to, to, to talk about two, two different niches. The first one, the traditional bat, sports batters, you need to educate about esports. And the second one, with the esports players, you must to educate them about sport betting. If you create these two voices, you can reach all the audience and improve your offers uh, in your sport, bat, sport betting site. That, that's the, the, the environment in Brazil. It's, it's very clear. It's very clear. Thank you, Angelo. And uh, Antonio, about virtual sports, do you think there is some kind of room in Brazil for, um, for this tendency, for this trend about virtual sports? Hi. Uh, yeah, well, first of all, I would like to, say, uh, to be in line with, with Angelo about this sport that uh, obviously, definitely, there is no industries in the in the last years in the we more and more technology companies interested in in being part of this industry of esports um to give some some insights we in the region of around 200 million uh, gamers and as uh, angelo mentioned uh 60 of the game between 18 and uh and so i think the, there is a huge potential you know And uh, well, Bubas, they must attract this display, as Angela mentioned. For this, uh, create the content creation. We have to educate the players to show them what kind of game they can, uh, they can bet, how they can bet uh, uh, in one way or another. We have to make them aware of this option. Uh, mm -hmm. The pandemic, I've seen many players um, showing promotions uh, in esports. You know, I, ha I have never seen. So many promotions about the esports in in the last uh, years. So I think it's a huge market. Brazil, Mexico, Peru, they are you know growing so so much. Even in Peru, we have for example a, a TV channel dedicated to esports. So I think it's the moment for the for the esports and uh, operators. They must um, uh, put attention and and uh, and uh, use this pandemic you know as a as an opportunity you know to to show the players that they can also in, uh, in esports. Okay. And uh, well, we have individual games as well. I mean, it's going to be, due to this lack of the events, uh, sport events is going to be a, a great opportunity for players to show the, another kind of products as virtual games or casino life or slots. So obviously we, we need to to give another up to them and, and uh, it's the perfect product to, to uh, solve this this issue of the lack of the events. Okay, thank you. Antonio. Fernando, thank maybe you. if I could just mention one very short thing. It's important to say that the law, as it stands today, refers to real sport and events, not to virtual sport and events. So that's very important in terms of esports and betting in Brazil, that at the moment, as the law stands, you know, we're talking about real actual sports and events like football and other types of sports, not esports specifically. Okay. That's Although there has been discussion maybe to open up not only to other types of sports like esports, but any type of event. So even betting on who's going to win Big Brother, things like that, there have been discussions on expanding the scope 
of uh, the type of events on which betting can occur here in Brazil. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Neil. And before we leave Brazil and get into, into Latin America, we have a question from Christian Bolen. He's asking, do operators that are currently operating in the not legal Brazilian market get punished with fines or waiting time to get the license in the future? Who can answer that? Neil? Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, I've already, answered, I've already <laughs> keyboard the answered. Um, the answer is no. Uh, there's no such restrictions, no blacklist at the moment. Uh, so far, the government has said that it is not willing to impose any sort of uh, quarantine. Uh, I think the intention is to get uh, the licenses out first. However, the government has always been very clear in the last few years that once the licenses are made available for those operators who have not obtained the license, then the government will start enforcing the legislation because so far in all these years, the government has been very lenient and not enforced the legislation, which at this stage is still prohibitive. But it says that once the licenses are made available, there will be enforcement for unlicensed operators. Yes. Okay. And, and we, we, we must understand that Brazil is facing uh, troubles, uh, uh, a lot of troubles in economics and political. And I think it's very difficult to, to limit uh, new revenues from, from private sector. So to increase the taxation and to increase the re uh, revenue of the state, I think that uh, we won't be uh, uh, limited. Uh, about these kind of things in Brazil, quarantine or black marketing, what else? And about the esports, uh, Brazil has a, a, a huge environment that I that I said, but we are also facing some confusion because we have two two authorities that that are own it the esports in Brazil, the confederation and uh, federation. So it's very difficult. It's uh, uncertainly environment in Brazil, point of view, the, the legally, as, as Neil said, and it's very, you must understand how the esports environment behind the market will go. So you must understand that to explore this kind of products in Brazil. And it's very important, as Antonio said, also to differentiate, to differentiate the, the virtuals from esports. It's uh, it's uh, there, there are two different products. You must understand the difference between them because one involving people, real people, and another one it's a computer product. So I, I see a lot of operation uh, operators uh, treating the both products as one. So it's very important to 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 not to create the same voice, the same message to these both. Uh, products. Okay, that's good. Well, now in this coronavirus breakdown, we cannot fly, you know that, but I invite you to fly from Brazil to Colombia. Colombia is a pioneer in Latin America regarding eye gaming and sports betting regulation. So what do you think uh, about other countries? They they will follow them? When and how seem to be the, the golden questions? And maybe Antonio can kind of start answering this. Yeah, well, uh, I'm going to focus in Peru, which is one of the uh, the biggest markets in America. Uh, we find a fully regulated based casino market, which was a uh, precedent in the region, uh, thanks to the current regulation dating for uh, 2000. The regulatory body is a uh, Minced, which is a uh, Ministry of Foreign Trade and Tourism of Peru. And uh, on the other hand, we find an online uh, re retail sport betting, gambling, you know, as casino, machines, uh, poker, or any kind of game, regulation in force. So uh, retail sport betting and virtual games are not prohibited. So they can uh, open a classic uh, bookmaker for real uh, and virtual games without any problem as long as you don't use slot machines inside the shops. And in the online uh, sport betting games and any kind of uh, vertical game uh, is not regulated, okay? But uh, this is protected by the Constitution of Peru. So any activity which is not illegal in Peru is not regulated. So you cannot have any problem. 
So we find uh, retail and online operators uh, in Peru with no need license. So most of them uh, they are operating offshore with a license from Cuba or Malta. And uh, there is no uh, gaming tax, okay? So the income tax, so to any any Peruvian company. And the uh, question when is going to be regulated? Well, uh, we have been uh, talking about regulation since 2013. There is a discussion regulation, uh, on sport based and gambling, and, and we only have draft bills uh, submitted to government. Congress for evaluation and discussion. So you never know. I, uh, I, don't, I don't believe it's going to be regulated this year. It's complicated and and also due to the political content that we, we have been through last year, where the president dissolved the Congress and uh, so we had no Congress at all. And uh, next year we're going to have elections. So I would say this year is going to be very complicated, but I hope next year we'll we we'll regulate the market because uh, it's it's very important for the Peruvian market. Current, mm -hmm. do you still have the same issue with your audio? Yes, yes, you still have the same issue. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm really sorry because your opinion here would be very very important because you know you have a very very good background with sports burning, with uh, uh, legalization of the iGaming industry in Latin America. So uh, it would be very helpful to, to listen to you. Um, well, now we invite you to talk about this uncertain situation of COVID-19. Uh, what do you think about how is this situation affecting retailers? Would the operators find any opportunity in this uncertainty? Nail, once again, if you want to start, No, I believe that we can't hear you. Uh, yeah. Yes, the COVID has indeed impacted here the market. First of all, because we don't have any real sports and events to bet on, right? The football is, is stopped, which is the main sport here in, in Brazil. I think worldwide, there are only three countries at the moment with championships like Nicaragua, I think Belarus and Turkmenistan. Uh, otherwise, here in Brazil, everything is, is stopped. The COVID also has had an impact, as I mentioned, on delaying uh, the regulations. Everything has come to a stop for the time being until things are over. So I believe operators at the moment are trying, are, are con for those who have, let's say, a, a casino book besides a sports book, they are, I think, still developing uh, that business, even though uh, it is either in the gray area or prohibited, depends on how you look at it. But uh, sports betting operators, specifically in relation to Brazil, are really having a tough time because there are no sports and events to bet on. That's right. Angelo. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> we are facing uh, uh, different times in Brazil because our operation is full uh, of a sport betting. So we were changing our mindset to, to improve and to implement our casino online. So our operation now is in standby, uh, trying to understand the, the, the current moments in Brazil. So it's very difficult uh, times with the COVID. So this is it's a, it's a huge problem, not for, for, for us only, but I, I know a lot of people from, from industry and a lot of operators and they are facing a huge problem in, in Brazil because Brazil is is uh, later when you compare with Europe about the timing to re restart the events. So it's gonna be a, 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 a 2020 harder than 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 now for sure. Okay, that's good. Can Karen. you hear me now? Yes. Oh, oh yeah! Hi. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> we were waiting for you. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I had to use my phone. It wouldn't work in the computer. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, with you, I would like to know about you about the um, regulation frame for the eye gaming and sports betting in Latin America. Well, you know a lot of of this stuff. So, if you can say something about this. 
Yes, yes, sure. And I know we don't have much time now uh, to go yeah, more over now. We, we yeah. have 20 minutes. Yes. So um, I will start first, as, as you asked about Latin America. You, you, you were talking about Colombia being the, being the one leading the online gaming regulations in the region. But I would like to talk about the online gaming regulations as the pre-Colombia and the post-Colombia era, no? Because uh, a lot of people talks about Colombia being the first jurisdiction and uh, the ones that are have been in the Latin American industry for uh, many years knows that before Colombia, there were still jurisdictions that of course operate and has online gaming legalized. It's just that it's not at the same level on the regulatory and legislation requirements. So we can talk about Mexico uh, with a mature uh, gaming market and of course, uh, an online gaming operation that depend that initially depended on the land-based uh, license and later uh, allowed for, uh, more recently, for uh, online opera operators to go ahead and request license themselves. Um, it's There's not really a specific regulation for online gaming. It's just uh, the mention that is allowed in the Mexican jurisdiction and uh, operators will need to request for that additional uh, sco scope in their license to operate. So uh, that's the case of Mexico. We have Panama since 2003 also that has uh, had an online gaming regulation only for offshore, only for uh, foreigners to be able to, to um, not once again, not at the level of the Colombia one, uh, but it's it's there and it was legal. Uh, in Argentina, we see several provinces that are still operating on their um, licenses that are given uh, to a specific to their land-based operators in each province. For example, we have San Luis, Tucumán, right? That we know that have been operating for several. Um, years before, even before Colombia, uh, and and those operations, for example, uh, are suffering now because in the case of Argentina, in this specific province, in six or seven that operates that way, it's an online offline type of operation where players do not uh, needs to go to an agency or to a retailer to deposit their monies and cash out their prices. So in a crisis like this, all these operations are suffering, no? Because of the way that they are implemented in these jurisdictions. Um, we have Uruguay too, we have countries like uh, Nicaragua and Belize, I'm sure some of the ones that are very, very into their own online gaming uh, jurisdictions knows about them. Um, and then Colombia, of course, came and regulated the market. Um, and that's when our regulator starts looking at the possibility of creating an online gaming industry that can be well regulated and controlled and become an important part of the of the economy. So with Colombia, with a market, well, taxes are 1.7 billion pesos a year, Colombian pesos a year, where 10% of that is uh, from online gaming. Uh, 16 operators are already in operation there. 80% um, of the of the revenue comes from sports betting. So what we are discuss what we were discussing before about esports and other lines of sport for this point is very important right now, of course, and and for all our Latin American uh, countries because as we know, sports betting is the major revenue. Um, any types of games are allowed there. The reception uh, of uh, betting on horse racing and party mutual games. Recently, as uh, many of you know, Colombia included, in addition to their uh, traditional casino game slots, etc., the operation also of um, live studios just last week. The draft was published for comments actually last week also. And uh, esports, fantasy sports that were discussed, we were discussing uh, before. Uh, one thing pending is international liquidity to be discussed also in a regulation, in a future regulation um, for this jurisdiction. Now, the key points that our, our other jurisdictions in Latin America are looking at when looking at Colombia as an example. Uh, first of all, uh, the open licensing process that they have, uh, you need to first comply with the regulations to then a request for a license with all regulations, legal, financial, and technical. Um, so that means that if you comply, the government will give you a license and there's not maximum amount of license. So that's a model that our jurisdictions are looking for, well, some of them. Uh, the responsible gambling requirements, not only on the policy, but also on the software and the platform, uh, operators platform, uh, which is very important when we are trying to justify in our countries the need to legalize online gambling and guaranteeing that it's going, the player is going to be protected. Uh, AML also, uh, money laundering prevention also, of course, is part of this legislation that, that our regulators are looking at. Um, 
strong advertising uh, uh, possibilities for the regulator to uh, direct the operators to legal operations only, to promote responsible gambling, um, to uh, also communicate where the money that, uh, that comes from gaming goes to, in the case of Colombia, to, to the health, no, to the health efforts. Uh, and finally, the safe and inspe inspection system that actually gives confidence to our regulators in terms of the information they need to get to supervise the activity and to make sure that operators are paying the taxes according to their revenue. Now, the era post-Colombia, um, we see different jurisdictions that starting opening up, like Paraguay, via bid processes, allowing for online gaming to their land base uh, operators as one licenses. We saw the, the bid for the sports betting operation also in, uh, in Paraguay, for example. We see the province of Buenos Aires. Everybody knows about that jurisdiction. Uh, the bid process went happened last year. Seven licenses still not granted, waiting for to be granted, but they uh, use the Colombia Spain model and in the regulation. Um, City of Buenos Aires, which just opened uh, last month for licenses, uh, open licensing process, also using the Spanish slash Colombia uh, model. Colombia actually referred to, to Spain on the regulations. And very recently, Panama, that uh, recently updated their online gaming regulations to allow not only for offshore, like before, but uh, for um, national or foreigners to bet uh, on online gaming operations. A small jurisdiction, but still is a new one. And we see that uh, we're advancing in the region. Uh, what we look for uh, that may happen in the, in the future, medium or long term, Latin American time, of course. Uh, we mentioned Peru, uh, Antonio was talking about that. It's been for a while in discussions about uh, projects of law, et cetera, that uh, may be approved in the future. Uh, we have also in Argentina several provinces that are now talking about regulating online gaming, especially because of the crisis, crisis right now and the lack of revenue they are getting. We see Entre Rios, Chubut, Salta, for example, that are looking to do it. Um, Chile, for example, is starting to look at it too, to understand that will need to be a change on legislation to be able to allow online gaming. Uh, and um, Puerto Rico is not Latin America, but they speak Spanish, so we don't mention them. Um, Puerto Rico legalized uh, online and land based sports betting last year, and right now they are in the process of issuing their regulations. And uh, we look forward to that market opening soon. Uh, I understand that their timeline is before August, so that will be also a very good market, especially for our uh, operators and, and suppliers because of the language and because it's still a territory of the U.S., it's a good way to start getting into the U.S. new jurisdictions uh, that may open um, That may open also. Um, but those are the ones that we see so far that could be in the in the in the future for legislation uh, for esports when you were talking about brazil sorry and, and i couldn't mention anything because you couldn't hear me but in the, in the case of esports in brazil um the brazil draft regulation does a lot of emphasis on match fixing and fraud prevention no so one of the things that we see with our uh, countries and regulators when they are they're going to allow for esports betting. It's um, the the fact that they had that they are part of an organization or a league that has rules that is supervising and monitoring the activity, right? So exactly things like match fixing and fraud uh, and fraud prevention are part of all these this equation, no? So that will be also important eventually. Um, and of course, I understand also in Brazil, they had a period of law to determine that esports are sports. I don't know if that happened or not, but that, that's something that Neil can comment. And that of course, it's more uh, more, more certainty that that it's, this will be part one of the of the sports to be allowed, no? Mm -hmm. Neil, do you want to add something yeah. else? Yes, no, that, that, that's true. There have been um, efforts in, in making esports sports because the Ministry of Sports has a list of everything that is considered to be a sport. And then if, if you get on the list, then potentially uh, you could also be allowed to bet on, on those sorts of sports. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. Okay, and something else, maybe uh, a new question, because... Argentina and Brazil, they have their laws about sports betting. They are approved, but they are not regulated. So at the end, it's some kind of gray 
that we have between the, uh, the approval of the law and the regulation of it. So what do you think about this situation? Because many operators have been waiting for a long time for Brazil and Argentina to open the market. And at the end, we have the law, but we don't have the regulation. What do you think about this? Well, uh, at least in relation to, to Brazil specifically, uh, until the enactment of the law at the end of 2018, uh, the, pos the legal position was that uh, sports betting and other types of online gaming uh, were pro prohibited. With the law in 2018, you can now say that uh, it is not unlawful to provide sports betting in Brazil. It would still be unlawful for other types of gaming, but sports betting specifically, my view is that with the law, it is, it is no longer unlawful. However, since it is not yet regulated, there are no licenses available, right? So uh, while the foreign operators in principle could still access the market, and as I said, Braz the Brazilian authorities have not imposed any quarantines, any bad actor clauses yet, uh, this will, to date, not affect uh, the ability to obtain a license. But if by any chance the new regulations do change that, then operators who are currently accessing the market must take care. But at the moment, there is a legal argument to say in Brazil that sports betting specifically would not be unlawful. Other types of gaming, yes, but sports betting, no. That's why even foreign operators are being able to sponsor Brazilian football teams. So there are many Brazilian football teams with the logos on, on the shirts why because it is legal it's just not regulated yet okay that's perfect and Karen, do you think that it's a similar situation in argentina in well in argentina and i know us we, uh, here the panelists understand how it works but just so everybody that is listening also understands argentina works uh, has a, um, jurisdictions per provinces there are 24 provinces so each province has the regulatory body for everything gaming and lottery so we cannot talk about the whole country as a whole um we as i, I as i mentioned before per provinces there are six or seven that already has online gaming operations and sports betting but only within their jurisdiction that's why the offline and online uh, a way that they operate uh, uh, since two years ago when the city of buenos aires and the province of buenos aires issued their own regulations and legislation for online gaming in their case it's going to be on, on fully online but there are requirements to uh, identify where the bets are coming from so you know that the bets are coming from within their territory so it's not that it's not um, it's not regulated it's not regulated for a whole country but it's regulated for specific jurisdictions and as i said city of buenos aires just opened the licensing process for that and it's really open for companies that wants to apply for a license for not only sports betting for any online gaming but uh, online gaming type of games casinos etc but lotteries you know, of course and horse racing which is also an exception Okay, thank you, Karen. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And we have seven minutes remain. So um, I would like to, to ask you to, to the four of you about this, this coronavirus breakdown. Of course, this situation changed, changed everything in the gaming industry, in the iGaming industry, industry, sports betting. So what do you think? Where will, be, where will we be in the next one or two years? Who wants to start? <laughs> 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 Antonio and Angelo? Okay. Uh, I can go on. Go, go on. Angelo. Okay. Well, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to say. Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, well, uh, it, it was a, it, it, it caused a, a impact, right? Uh, so, Land-based operators are the most effective. I mean, uh, they go to casinos, betting shops, so it's a huge impact. For example, in Peru, we have over 700 casinos. And the government right uh, to the entertainment, to the industry. So uh, uh, now is the time for the for the line. And uh, line operators trying to, trying to survive this crisis and keeping their revenues on the world still suffering the reduction, uh, one that allows them to, to support the, the operation. 
and uh, also they have to change their strategy. I mean, uh, in terms of the marketing, they're looking for new products uh, to to give the, the, this. Uh, I mean, to given to this lack of sport events. So, in Peru, for example, before the crisis, uh, yeah. of the turnover was uh, coming, from and now we are facing a, a growth of uh, vertical products, uh, games, uh, casino, life casino bingo poker whatever so one of the keys to success is uh, is now uh, how to uh, officially promote the new offer of the products uh, so the content of the creation thing is going to be the key you know for uh, to see how they can play uh, games how they can play blackjack how they can bet on a slot because uh, most of the players from land don't even have account in a in a online opera, uh, platform so they need they need to educate the players. And, um, it's a great opportunity for operators to to why they offer. After the crisis, we will see has a position it, and we'll find obviously operators with platforms. So I think it has been a, a great opportunity uh, for the other to improve. Perfect. Uh, I agree. I, 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 yeah. Four minutes. Four minutes yeah. remaining. I will, so I will, I will, take, minutes. I will take just one minute. Uh, I agree with Antonio about the future of the new product, and I will go forward. Uh, we must to see and to look for a U.S. Uh, carrying is, is is there. Uh, we must to understand how the the TV is growing with new betting pro, uh, shows like the ESPN and Fox. And I think that's the, 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 that's will be the future of the, the, the entertainment with batting. I think that we must explore even more this kind of products between television and sports batting operators. It's a great synergy and we must to uh, face these, these new products and improve this kind of uh, products to, to our fan base. It's, it's, it was quickly. <laughs> yes, and I would like to add yes. something on the same on the same line that uh, Antonio uh, and Angelo. And I would like to say that uh, we will want to see more land-based operators getting also involved in on online gaming. Uh, the reality in our countries is that uh, the percent of the population that access to the banking and has uh, credit cards and have bank accounts uh, is not the majority. So uh, having retailers, having agencies, having uh, physical points of, uh, of, of, of interaction with the online gaming operation is important. Um, we have some countries where land-based operators are against online gaming because they think it's going to cannibalize their operation. Uh, with the reality we're living today, uh, I think it's a great opportunity to understand that the channels, it could, the omni-channel can exist, that land-based operators could be also benefiting of the online gaming channels, and uh, maybe their synergies will exist uh, for both. No, for the full online that could get retail uh, retail opportunities with land based and land based accessing the online uh, gaming uh, environments. No, and of course on the game content that Antonio was also mentioning, um, and and we heard it in many conferences already. Um, there needs to be more content for casino, for poker type of games, esports, etc. So the diversification of the off of the gaming offer to the player is uh, is is more is different, is diverse, and we don't depend on only one uh, line of business. Which uh, it seems that until today it was sports betting being the seventy almost eighty percent of revenue, no, of our operators. And Nail, do you want to, to close this panel with, sure. with something else? Sure, I think uh, it's quite a, a little bit of criticism to the Brazilian government. I think the government lost a great opportunity at the end of last year. They were rehearsing to issue the regulations under the authorization model where an unlimited number of licenses could be made available. If they had done so, now with, during the pandemic, it would have been a great opportunity to have as many operators as possible uh, set up in Brazil, duly licensed and, and conducting the sports 
sports betting, even though we don't have the actual sporting events, but for some time or, or doing other types of events, this could have been a great opportunity. Now, switching to the concession model, if that is going to stick, it's going to be a bit more difficult. And I think it goes against the intention of the government to generate as much revenue in the form of taxes and jobs as well for our country. So unfortunately, it was a, a an opportunity that was greatly missed by, by the government. Okay, that's good. Well, we have just 44 seconds, so I want to thank you all of you. I want to thank to the attendees. Uh, thank you, Karen, once again for waking up so early, and and you too, Antonio. And so, so do I, because it's 6:45 <laughs> in Brazil as well. 6:45 <laughs> for me. It's not so early. <laughs> not so early. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, and thank you to everybody for for joining us.